So I'm probably gonna get a lot of flack for this video, but today we're gonna be talking about how I believe managed money, fee-based management is one of the greatest ripoffs in the world. I know a lot of times people are talking about how expensive whole life insurance is and why you should never save your money there. You should start investing while you're really young. But in this video, I'm gonna go over the details about how fee-based management works, uh, what the actual implications are on the potential growth of your money, and, and ultimately how much money over the lifetime that your fee-based managers are gonna make. I know it's sold on the idea that, hey, we make money when you make money. If you lose, we lose, we don't make as much. And so they kind of position it like they're on the same team. And don't get me wrong, there's an element of truth to that. However, there's also another side to that coin. There's another side to that story that shows the, that by doing fee-based management, the reason it's so popular is because it's basically annuitizing their business. They're creating passive semi-passive income when they get money under management, assets under management to be able to do so. And so in this video, I just wanna break down the numbers for everybody to really understand the actual costs of dealing with a financial advisor that does fee-based management. So let's go. So if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell, that way you're notified every time I launch a video. Let's get into it. Hey, what's going on, Cashflow Hackers? It's Chris, Life180. In this video, we're talking about fee-based management. What is the cost of it? What does that look like? Uh, what is the potential of uh, investing and you reaching your goals by saving in, and, and investing in accounts with a buy and hold mentality, riding the market up and down, paying a fee-based manager to manage your money and uh, starting from a really young age. So I'm gonna hop right into this. I don't wanna waste a lot of time here. Uh, what I did was I put an Excel sheet together that I think is gonna make everything really, really clean, really understandable here. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna share my screen and we are gonna get right into it and uh, we're gonna have some fun. So I gotta look up here uh, because I got my monitor up high where I have this thing, um, but uh, let's go. So let me, let me give a little breakdown of what we're talking about here. So you can see I started at age 24, somebody who just maybe got out of college with a $50,000 a year income. The idea is somebody annual savings contribution of 10%, that's what this is. The income you'll see is going up. I did a 3% a cost of living adjustment for income assuming that you know between inflation and your earning potential, hopefully you will actually far surpass this. Um, but uh, worst case scenario, I think this is, this is just kind of saying with 3% inflation, which I think is reasonable, uh, this is what you need to earn to maintain your standard of living uh, when you get out of college. So by all means, I hope you beat that, but just know that that's how this is built. Uh, we got the annual savings contribution is 10% of the this year's income. So obviously you're saving more and more every year as you're making more and more. Uh, we're assuming 8% returns um, because that's what most advisors tell you you can do. I personally feel like that's a little unrealistic when you look at everything uh, kind of together. Um, in fact, I just talked to a client yesterday um, that I was talking to with, with uh, one of my guys uh, and he was saying he was really uh disenchanted a little bit with his UBS guy because he was down 18% last month last year because everybody was down last year right and the UBS guy was like well you know what um you're down 18% last year but you're not really down because look at how much you were up and then when he averaged out his returns after the 18% year over the past like 8 or 9 years he was only averaging about 6 and a half to 7% and that doesn't even include taking out the managed money fees and so um, and this is during the greatest bull run of all time, right? And so when you think about that, um, it's important to understand, um, you know, what's really happening with our money and, and, and what you need to look into. And so that's kind of what inspired this video, honestly, is that conversation. And so then we have uh, the 8% returns. You can see that this column is, is the annual savings contribution plus 8% returns. That's the end of the year value, uh, so to speak. Uh, and then we're saying there's a managed money fee of 1%. If you could do that, um, because these are you know, people that are charging a 1% fee uh, to manage money of assets under management. By the way, you're gonna have a hard time finding any, any asset managers that are willing to take you on with this just amount right there. Um, so that, that part's hard. So from that angle, this is a little unrealistic. Um, but once again, like with most videos I do, I'm just doing this to show the principle. And if the principle works in this scenario, it's gonna work in every scenario. It's just we're gonna compound that principle if they're gonna make you start with bigger chunks of money, maybe when you're a little older. Um, but you know, hey, this is, you know, this is what we're talking about. So then after you pay your investment um, fees, 
uh, to a money manager, you all are your managed money fee. This is the fee to the manager. Every investment that you make is pretty much going to have a fee, whether it's to the mutual fund company, whether it's to an actual third party money manager, um, the company that your fee based person is, is, is got a relationship with and connecting you with and, and getting the investments through. And so I just did a quarter percent for that. And so then this is the total of these two columns paid together. And then account balance is uh, this account value minus the fees equals the account balance. And then finally, on the last column here, I have this is what your potential money growth is without fees involved. Now, obviously, you see out of the gate, the fees are not crazy, right? I mean, like you're talking total fees, uh, you know, what, 10 years in or so um, at age 33 is only a thousand bucks. You got $81,000. That doesn't seem so crazy, right? Um, and, and if you look at this, the challenge is when you, when you spend money on these fees and you're, you're paying these uh, fees no matter what, well, let, first of all, let's talk about why did, why did uh, the financial industry start trending towards this fee-based management rather than commissions on selling financial products like mutual funds instead of getting like a 5% commission for a mutual fund when people buy and hold. Um, the idea was well, you're, you're probably not gonna hold that mutual fund forever. You're probably not gonna hold that asset, whatever it is, because every financial product has a commission associated with it, typically. And so rather than uh, paying that commission there, it, it basically was geared to disincentivize, right? Like advisors from moving people's money around just to churn and make commissions, right? Because that was happening a lot in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. And so they instead said, hey, let's put us on the same page as you. Uh, and let's let's just charge a 1% fee of all assets under management. And regardless of what happens, um, you know, we can move you around. Uh, you will have to pay this investment fee, right? That is what it is. Um, but when, as we move your money around, we're not going to make additional commissions. And okay, I get it. And I, and I understand that part. So I don't want to like, you know, talk down to the intention of that because, you know, that part is real. Um, however, if you actually spreadsheet it out, you'd be better off paying a little more commission up front and not paying uh, the big robust annual fee 1% over a period of time. If you actually hold an investment uh, for any, any reasonable amount of time, say five to seven years, it actually works out better to just pay the commission on that investment up front. And so once again, it's like, like all things, planning is important, right? Understanding what the end goal is and the objectives understanding what those are, it's going to help you make better decisions. And unfortunately, this is why I always say people struggle with their money because their money is not in alignment with their values and beliefs. Uh, they are putting their money in places that they don't understand. And if you if you're doing that, well, then you're going to you're going to make bad decisions. Right. And so um, now the managed money fees are hopping in here uh, for people like let's say you're doing one uh, percent of AUM assets under management. Um, and, and this is what I want to show. I want to get down here. Uh, oh man, I should have done this before. Hold on one sec. I want to, uh, I want to view, I want to freeze this row, one row, bang. Okay. So now as we go down here, um, I, I'm going to skip right to the end because I, I think it's just, um, really important to, to kind of highlight, um, the potential here, right? So I'm going to go down here and you can see We've contributed as our income goes up. Remember, at 65 years old, this $167,000 of income is just assuming a 3% rate of inflation. So this is not $163,000, $167,000 in today's value. This is $167,000 in future value, um, which is effectively the equivalent, assuming a 3% rate of inflation, the purchasing power, the equivalent of what a $50,000 year income would be today right here in 2023. And so when we look at that, this is uh, the savings, we're going across, but as this accumulates, right, with the managed money fee, they're talking $16,000 this year. Um, we've got the 8% the returns on all the account value. Uh, the account balance you can see here um, is $1,677,000. 1% of that is 16,000, uh, you know, 16,000, actually the account value here is, is that 16, uh, 1,698,000 minus out the 16,000 plus the fees to the investments, um, total managed money and fees paid is 21,000 that year. And that gets you, uh, to the number that you actually have in your account after fees. 
And so here's the deal. This is where the number compounds because as you pay this 1% fee and this quarter percent fee, it doesn't seem like a lot, but had you not had to pay those, if you you because you have to take those into consideration. When, when advisors say, hey, you're gonna get 8% on your money, well, that that that's not after fees. That's a, a gross rate before you net out the fees, before you pay those fees. And so you have to look at it like, what would the potential be if I actually didn't pay those fees? And you, the potential growth is actually $2,362,000. So if you look at that, you're talking about a, a $700,000 difference. And, and when you look at that, that's basically saying by paying this 1% managed money fee, you are looking at a situation where 30% of the potential growth of your retirement plan is taken away, which seems really weird because 1% of an 8% average is only 12.5%, I believe. Yeah, I think, yeah, 20, 12.5%. So 1% of 8% is 12.5%, but because of the fact that it compounds against you and these fees compound against you, because when you pay that fee, not only do you lose that fee, you lose what you could earn on that money forever. Right, and so that is the problem with the fee-based management. And, and, and from from a from a client perspective, now from an an advisor perspective, that's why they love it because they know that that money is going to compound for them. And if you could just build your assets under management and build that with your clients and keep accumulating more assets, that's how it compounds for them, and that's how they create this kind of pseudo passive income as an advisor. And it's made it so they don't have to be salespeople anymore, which there's an element of 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 good in that as well, but it's made it so they don't have to become salespeople anymore and they can just literally be more service-based. Uh, and for that, you know, like I said, there's some good stuff there. So I don't want to, uh, you know, talk all down on it. However, on the, on the monetary side, I think there are a lot of better places that you can put your money uh, and control and, and statistics show, you can go look at Dalbar statistics that show manage money, uh, you know, fee-based planners, don't beat the index anyway. So you're basically paying them for something you could just do on your own and by just taking your money and put it in the S&P if in fact that's where you wanna go, right? And so when, when you look at this, 30% um, of your potential uh, growth of your money is, is gone just because of the fee-based management. 12.5% uh, of, of your average growth at 8% on the assumptions here, uh, uh, 12.5% of that is paid in fees, but it winds up being 30% of your potential uh, growth of the policy of the uh, of the account value. And so, when you when you look at that, um, I, I think it's really important just to look at those numbers and to understand those numbers. And um, I would say, it's it's just it's not good or bad. It's just understanding what you're putting your money into, right? And this is one of the big reasons that. Unfortunately, I believe that too many people start investing too soon. Uh, they start taking on too much risk too soon. And I think people need to start saving before they invest. And that's one of the biggest reasons that I'm a huge advocate of whole life insurance is because it's not an investment, it's a savings alternative. And a lot of people think, well, why would I invest in whole life insurance when I can invest and crush the returns in this other asset or, or give money to my money manager and get 8% and all this stuff. Well, because it's, it's not the same kind of vehicle, there's not the same risk profile and it doesn't solve the same problems for you in life. And financial structure is really important. So before you go and take on risk in investments, you need to make sure you build the financial foundation of your financial house, which should be safe, guaranteed, liquid, accessible capital in case of emergency, in case of opportunity, because of market cycles, uh, the boom bust cycles that we live through. We're going through them right now, right? And so you need to prepare for that. And if you don't build your foundation, you could have a great account value, like what we're showing up here, right? We could, you could have all this and you can, it could be great and, and that's fantastic. But if you don't have a good foundation and, and, and protection, well, a financial storm comes through and a lot of this can be wiped out overnight uh, without you having any protection about it. And so that's why I'm a big believer we need to save first before we invest, but we need to save with the intent of investing and building our emergency fund and getting everything uh, done. Now, you, if you could do both at the same time, that's fantastic, you know, save and invest at the same time. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, in the, uh, I talk to dozens of people every week, it's very rare to find somebody at a young age that feels like they can save and invest at the same time based on cash flow restrictions. So if you had to choose one of the two, what are you gonna choose? That's the question. 
Unfortunately, most of the country will tell you you need to invest and take risks. The younger you are, the more risk you can take. I would argue the complete opposite of that. And I hopefully this video makes sense. And if it doesn't, I'm actually going to put another video on the end screen that's going to show you how whole life insurance will help you at all different phases of your life between the age of 18 and the day you die uh, and how you can leverage it as a powerful asset to help you get there. Uh, so I encourage you to watch that. And if you have any questions, comment in the comment section below. You can always email me, chris at life180.com. Happy to help in any way I can. And if you are interested in having a clarity call with one of my uh, coaches, we have CFP on staff. We have uh, you know coaches about how to utilize and design whole life insurance that I've coached on how to do it personally. If you want to have a clarity call with one of them, you can absolutely do that. And, uh, and, and it'll, uh, it'll give you a lot more clarity and understanding because I don't believe you should invest or put your money into any asset that you don't understand. So uh, that's it. Have a blessed, inspirational day. We'll talk soon. See ya.